Hello, everybody. This is Paul Tinkle on this week's 30 Minutes program. And our guest today is the former coach of the University of Tennessee at Martin football team, Coach Bob Carroll. Coach Carroll is being inducted into the Weekly County Hall of Fame. He's in a lot of Hall of Fames, but this is one that really is touching to him. Coach, thanks so much for coming to visit with us today and uh, and to share with us a few things uh, that uh, you would like for people to know about your UT Martin football days. Well, I, listen, I appreciate being here, and I had some enjoyable days back when, you know, I was coaching, and also, of course, I played here back in my younger years, too, so I've been around here a good while. You have a storied history of teaching and coaching and serving our country. Now, I'm going to go back first. You grew up in Milan, Tennessee. Right, most of the time. I actually was born in Fort Worth, Texas. This was during the Great Depression. As you know, when you're 92 years old, then you were caught, uh, your parents were in that Great Depression, but moved to Tennessee when I was five and started the school there in Milan. And I graduated from Milan in 1950. Milan High School. And then what happened? Well, first thing I did, I started school here at UT Martin in the fall of 1950, but then the Korean conflict broke out, and when it did, then I joined the Marine Corps, and my two brothers were already in the military, one's in the Navy and the other's in the Army, so I said, well, I've got to go in and do my part too, so I headed off to Paris Island, South Carolina, or and then up to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And you were in the Marine Corps. For how many years? Well, I was in action, active duty two years, but then I was in reserves four years. And the story is four of us went in together. And so when we went in, two of us said, well, let's just take a gamble and we'll join reserves, go on active duty that day, and then when things settle down, we can go home. Well, the other two said, uh uh-uh, uh, we're going to take three years because when we get through, we're through. And I said, okay, whatever you say. But uh, two of us took the two years, and then, of course, we were released. The other two stayed on for the three years. But then I was in reserve for four years, and each year I just sweated a little bit, said, well, I maybe get called back any time. And so finally, then I finished my four years. And But uh, it was, you know, uh, I tell everybody that, you know, when you, I really volunteered to go to Korea three times, and I got turned down every time. I was a company uh, property sergeant, but then, and so I knew where a lot of the equipment and everything was, and so they, you're, uh, well, the commanding officer called me and said, you're not going anywhere, because he said, we'd have to train somebody else. So I said, okay. That been the case, what I'll do, I'll just quit applying to go somewhere and things. And so that's it. I stayed at Camp Lejeune, finished up, and then, of course, was released. And you uh, came back to Martin? Is that when you? Yeah, I came back to Martin, played two years here. Now, uh, Who was your coach? Uh, Jim Henson was the coach then. James Henson is uh, James what? C. Henson. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I I can remember the stature of that man. I can see him. I can just um, powerful, powerful uh, uh, individual who loved kids. Yeah, he really did. He uh, he had been a good football coach in his days too. Uh, not coach, but a player. And then, of course, uh, he was coaching when I was playing on that. And but anyway, uh, what year was that when you played football here? I played well, really, in the fall of 1950. I actually played, but then I came back and played in 52, 53, and then I played at Wyoming in 54, 55. Were there lights on the field here at UT Martin at that time? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we did have nighttime football. Oh yeah, we okay. had nighttime football. We had big time back then. But now my father-in-law played here in. Uh, 28, 29, and 30, and they didn't have lights. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But in the meantime, they did get lights. So uh, what position did you – how many positions did you play? Well, basically, I was a quarterback. But also, uh, when I went to Wyoming, then I was a single-wing blocking back. In other words, you swung under the – from the side to get the ball – if you were the one supposed to get it, otherwise it would snap directly to the tailback. But now, 
one thing, my high school coach, uh, Bob Hicks, uh, he was my coach in Maryland my junior and senior years. And so after I finished here, well, he got in touch with me and they offered me a scholarship to Wyoming, so I took out to Wyoming. Now, I will say one thing about it. When, uh, you know, Mile High Denver, well, Laramie is 7,200 feet. You go up to Laramie, surrounded by mountains now that are 12,000 feet. And so when I got there on Friday, we started football practice on Monday. And I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I couldn't, I well, it's hard to breathe and things. Your lung capacity has to build up and things like that. And so it worked good on that. So you came back to UT Martin. Back then it was UT Martin Branch, is that correct? UTMB? Uh, it or was, UT? Well, when I came back now, they only had you know, really ag and home economics, and then gradually they added to it. But uh, when I first started coaching, you had ag and home ec with only four-year programs out here on things. Uh, but uh, actually the enrollment, I can't remember exactly, it's somewhere around 500. And then, of course, they added really education is the one that really, you know, helped get more and more students. And then and made it a four-year program. Was it at UTM Junior College, UTMB, UT Martin Branch? What was it then? Well, what it started out is really started out as Hall Moody, and then it became part of the UT system. And the thing is UT Junior College, mm -hmm. and then UT Martin Branch, and then UT at Martin. So it went through those different ones. So... To fast forward this, you came back to Martin from Wyoming yeah. and finished your degree and then became the football coach yeah. and a history teacher? Yeah. Uh, I was laughing about it because really when I was coaching, then half of my job was to teach history and half of it was to coach football. And uh, needless to say, uh, you say, well, you can go over and lecture for three hours, which I did, 8 to 11. Normally, I had some other schedules. They varied the schedule. Hours when I was in college in 1972, it was 1 to 2, 1 to 150 to be exact. That's what your class, yeah, yeah. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and I, <laughs> at other times, I had it where uh, it was an iron. In other words, I had three hours, but you had two classes during that three hours and things uh but i tell you what it was good because you could go in that history room to teach the class shut the door and want the telephone in there so it, <laughs> it worked pretty good now, i enjoyed uh, students but now what people say well teaching going in and teaching doesn't take that long well the thing about it is you have to give exams grade those exams reading reports and all those things all right, you know, I'm going to ask this question, and you know what is coming. How much were you paid back then? My last year or back then? Well, your, like your, fir your first year? $4,200. Okay. And when and I was named the head coach in 1957, $4,200. Now, was that for teaching and coaching? Yeah. Okay. Well, well the thing about it is, uh, uh, we had a good year the first year, we lost one game. And so, consequently, then they said, well, by golly, so they up me to 5000 I thought, man, if I get $10,000, i will be rich. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the thing about it is, really, I enjoyed it. It was, you know, a lot of fun coaching and teaching both. But now the thing about football, after the first two years, those teams that we uh, won on pretty good the first two years, well, then what happened is they dropped us and things because we won pretty well. And then we had to start playing Murray State, Middle Tennessee, Austin P and Tennessee Tech and those schools. And that was a new challenge you had to get ready for. What was recruiting like or was there recruiting? Just go to the high schools and bring these kids up or do you have really go out and recruit people? No, actually we had enough context uh from other sources and things and so recruiting then we'd go now i've went to high schools all in west tennessee and some in middle tennessee recruiting that's part of it 
And then we had some people that I knew pretty well, coaches and things, and they'd call and recommend players mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, we were fortunate in that we did get some, you know, good athletes and things. Uh, one is a good athlete is, you know, right there with us today. Oh, Gary Capers, he was a fine athlete. How did you get Gary Capers to come from the north to the south? He realized, uh, you know, down here is probably a better lifestyle. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, he found his wife here. I well, mean. <laughs> that's right. I tell you, he was a darn good football player, I tell you that. All right, let's talk about something that everybody still talks about today, the Tangerine Bowl. What was the Tangerine Bowl? Well, yeah, we played Westchester out of uh, Pennsylvania in it, in the Tangerine Bowl. And people said, I've never, never heard of Westchester. Well, when they looked, they were ranked fifth in the nation in Division Two, which we were Division Two at that time. And we, of course, we were ranked uh, because we'd only lost one game that year. And so consequently, uh, we were ranked, I think, about 12, somewhere that no lower than that. But mm -hmm. anyway... Uh, when we played them on things, well, of course, uh, we went up there and we were the underdog and so forth in the game. We beat them 25 to 8. And when it was over with, their athletic director made a statement. He said, we just got a butt swept. Well, they did. Though we had some good players, and they did a good job. We got out there, and fortunately, we won the game. All right, I'm going to pause from you now and take to Gary Capers. Gary works here at our studios at Thunderbolt Broadcasting. A longtime marketing representative, former Westview High School football coach, got a lot of learning from Coach Carroll, no question about that. And uh, Gary, you are uh, you and Coach still play a little golf from time to time, and you still have a close relationship. And Coach, tell me, I, the story goes like this: Gary is the caught the only touchdown pass in the Tangerine Bowl. You That's remember? Right. It? Yeah, I sure I do. He reached up and snagged it and pulled it in. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, Coach, I, I really want to thank you for giving me an opportunity. Uh, I started out my football career at West Virginia University, and I think a, a former coach uh, from up there went to Knoxville, if I, if I remember the story, and I think he called you because – we had uh, our coach at West Virginia was fired, and a lot of us decided we were going to try to f find a new home somewhere. And uh, I remember getting a phone call from you one day, and you you asked me if I'd uh, be interested in coming down to see what UT Martin was like. And, uh, you know, my choice right then was uh, uh, perhaps going to, that's when the Vietnam War was going on and everything, and I really wanted to get for, keep my education going and uh i said i uh, asked my parents to take me down because uh, they wanted to see where uh, if i was going to another school what it was all about and everything uh so we left ohio and started heading to ut martin and uh, i think at that time it took 22 or 23 hours to <laughs> to make the drive no interstates or anything like that and uh you know and i it, uh, I just uh, just met uh, met you and the coaches, and uh, you all offered me a scholarship, and uh, you know the rest was history. My my intent was to come graduate because I'd had two years of college already, and I was going to move back to Ohio where I grew up. And as, as Paul said earlier, I met a a girl from Gleason, Tennessee, who I guess captured my heart. And, and uh, here here I am uh, many, many years later back in Martin, Tennessee again. I love the place. And, uh, again, I want to thank you personally. I don't know if I've ever done that or whatever. Now that we're on the air, I'd like to thank you for molding me into a, a decent person, I guess. And I appreciate you saying I was a pretty good athlete back then. Well, I remember that you were also a dead gum good guy on and off the field, but you were a heck of a good football player also. Uh, if you don't mind, let me reminisce just a moment on one thing. When I became the head coach here in the spring in 1957, you know how many coaches I had on my staff for spring practice? I have no idea, Coach. None. I, I was it. 
You know how many coaches I had the first two years? I don't have any idea. One. One? <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, who, was, who was your assistant coach then? He was, uh, I'm trying to remember it now. He left after one year, but he really became the head coach at Moorhead when he left here. And so he did, but he did a good job on it. You know, when you get 92 years old, I am sometimes slippy, but uh, Guy Penny was his name. And Guy Penny was, a, he was a good coach. We had a lot of fun. And like I said, the schedule we played then wasn't nearly as tough, but it was tough enough because we only had like ag and home economics as far as four-year programs. How many students, how many football players did you have on the team in that first year? 20? Uh, no, we had more than that. Uh, the first year, we probably had 40. Now, as far as aid, we didn't have a lot of aid to give them, but by the same token, we were able to give them some. And, of course, now we had a, a dormitory that had been a World War II barracks building. is out on campus. They had put it on campus, and so that's as far as our athletic dorm and everything. You remember that, Gary? You remember those days? Uh, yes, sir. I, I vaguely remember, yeah, even after all these years, yes, sir, I have fond memories of Well. That. When he was here, now we actually had a good dormitory because after two or three years, that old dormitory, uh, well, it wasn't too good to live in because we didn't have really any heat to mount to anything. And then the winters, it got kind of chilly in that building. And then, in fact, one of the players one day said, Coach, come here, I'll show you something. I went back there. And the water in the commode was frozen. So, <laughs> so I went to Paul Meek, and I told him, I said, we got problems. So what he did then is he moved us into the basement of the men's dormitory. And other play, we got some good room, and it, Paul Meek was really good. He helped every way he could and things. Was there a football game that, besides the Tangerine Bowl, that stands out for you? reminiscing all the games you coached? Well, not any particular game, but I have fond memories on several of them where we won that really we weren't supposed to. And, of course, now I have one or two memories where we lost one or two that I went to happy <laughs> about, too. But uh, as far as it went, uh, we enjoyed you know playing most of the schools, but after we started playing the Ohio Valley Conference schools and things, then it worked for good because we uh, had to adjust to playing them because they had, of course, more senior uh, seniors, I should say, and so forth than we did because we didn't offer that many courses here. When did you know it was time to give up football? Well, i tell you what. When you get to be in your 40s and you've coached for 18 years and you get kind of just beat down, and the thing about it is, I'm still trying to teach and coach and recruit and everything else. And after a while, it finally gets to you. So that's why I suggested they need to get somebody else because uh, you just get worn out. What was it like to coach your last game, and where was it? Uh, I don't remember the last game, but coaching there, I enjoyed the coaching regardless of who we playing and everything, but I really – uh, you get kind of tired and beat down, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, that's just part of coaching because if you coach, you go get kind of tired and everything, but I enjoyed it. You want to share with us how you were able to get film on someone else and bring the, what, 16 millimeter? Is that what you were looking at? Yeah. Well, we traded films with the opponents. We didn't have any trouble on getting films. Mm -hmm. And uh, Westchester... We traded films with them and so forth before we played in the Tangerine Bowl. You had a number of great assistant coaches. Yeah, we did. Uh, like I said, through the years, and eventually I was able to get more assistant coaches, and they did well. And of the coaches on my staff at the end, then Vernon Prather is the only one who still – uh, with us, the other three, of course, we've lost. I'm thinking of Jack Beeler, one of them. Yeah, Jack was one of them, Ross Elder, Grover Page. Yeah, and and all of these guys, they really loved 
Martin, they stayed here. Oh, yeah, they did. Made their home here. Yeah, they stayed here and everything. And really and truly, uh, we had some enjoyable times later on when, you know, we were out of coaching and everything. But uh, sad to say, then, then we've uh, only, Vernon Price is the only one left. If you've just joined us, Coach Bob Carroll is our guest. He's being inducted with others that are going into the Weekly County Hall of Fame. So your life at football, we set aside for a moment, but you raised three children, beautiful wife, got lots of grandchildren, and you're still here today. You didn't move away. You made Martin your home. Well, I love Martin. I mean, it's a great place to live and everything, the county. And, of course, then uh, my father-in-law and so forth, Kay's dad and mother, they had moved from Munford up to Dresden. He had bought a farm and everything at Dresden because uh, Kay's younger brother uh, had played for me, and so he was up here and everything, and so they just bought a farm and everything and built a home and moved up here, which was good. Uh, as I may have mentioned, uh, he was a retired uh, principal, high school principal, and so uh, he wanted to be up here with his kids, and he was a great guy. I really enjoyed having him around. And where are your children today, your wife? Your... Well, my children today, uh, Steve is head of ba- uh, pathology at the Medical University of South Carolina, and then Kayla's in Los Angeles. She's uh, with a business firm there, and then I have two granddaughters. One's in Chicago, and one's in Houston. And then the only grandson I have is in Los Angeles also. As I've said before now, those kids, they got as far away from me as they could. <laughs> <laughs> Cliff. Yeah, now Cliff, I'm sorry. <laughs> he's he's my son. Of course, he's uh, he didn't have any children. He's... He'd been married, but no kids. A little farming going on, I guess. Yeah, he farms. Yeah. And, of course, he really is my golfing partner and everything. And uh, he and I are fixing to do some things together today. How did you meet your wife, Kay? Uh, With luck. Uh (laughs) No. What happened? I came back uh, here at the university and became the head coach and things, but there's a good looking cheerleader and things and we got to know each other just you know casually and things and i couldn't ask her for a date because i was staff and she was a student (laughs) so i went i went to paul meek and i asked him i said uh is it all right if i date a student he said, I know both of you. Go ahead. So I did. <laughs> and the next thing happened, then about a year and a half later, we got married. What was Paul Meek, the chancellor, like? A great guy. Really, really a good guy. Now, if he told you he'd do something, he did it. And uh, and if uh, you wanted to get something done, if he could do it, he would help you on that thing. But back then, of course, we had to... Money, you know, we didn't have big enrollments, so you didn't have the money and things that you might have like today. But, uh, and of course, even today, now you have, you know, restrictions on uh, the amount of money you have, too. We're not rich here, uh, even today. I won't get into the stuff of uh, NIL stuff, and I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about one other thing players. Now, Gary Capers is one of your players, and you have a lot of them that are still here right and sadly some of your players have passed away but larry shanks comes to my mind and i'm going to let gary uh, share a couple of things in a moment but tell me about larry shanks and the kind of football player he was larry shanks was a hard-nosed football player and i guarantee you when it came down to getting in and getting with it he'd get in and get with it now he was just a hard runner good runner good blocker and above all, just a good guy. Randy Barnes. Uh, Randy Barnes, he was a heck of a good kicker. I can tell you that because he was a darn good kicker. I tell you that. And a good guy to coach, too. Gary, we've got some other players that I'm sure you can call right off the top of your head. Well, uh, 
couple of guys that came down. Mike Coffer, and I know you think a lot of oh, him. Yeah. And uh, uh, to, you, see, you got what do you want to say about Mike, real quick? Mike Coffer was a darn good football player. In fact, really, I talked with him. Oh, it hadn't been very long ago on things. And Mike Coffrin, uh, if I remember correctly, he's about 88 now. He's not that young. Yeah, but, that's uh, true. So Four but, years younger than you? Yeah. Is that what you're telling me? You, had, you were four years older of one of your players? Is that what you're – we, Well, now, when I first started coaching, I had a player two older than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you had uh, no uh, age limits in no, college. Time I was, so, so when I became the head coach, I was 25. All right. Advice for a coach today, starting out, beginning a program, what would you say? Well, the first thing you want to do is get to know your players, understand how to motivate them, and be able to converse with them and so forth so that they understand you know, what you want and everything. And another thing you find out about players that some people don't think about, there are three types of players. Some that you just brag on them and, boy, they go wild. And just get, they do everything you can. Then you've got some that you're going to have to chew out to get them to do what you really want them to do. But the ideal player is the one that you just say, we need to do this, this, and this, and they do it. And old Gary, he was one of those where he'd just go do what you wanted done and things. You, in other words, you just explain to them what you're trying to do and what they need to do, and they go do it. And so if what you have to do as a coach, you decide what type of player a kid is, how to motivate him, and then you go from there. Do you have any regrets of giving up football earlier than maybe later in your life? I have no regrets about it. There comes a time in your life I really enjoyed it. But then there comes a time when you have to decide, hey, there may be some other things, you know, in life and so forth. And I really enjoyed uh, in, being in administration and things there at the university. Did you have any of your football players in your history classes? Yeah. Now, some of them avoided. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would only say this. You taught me, and I'm forever grateful to have been in your uh, classroom the tennessee uh university of tennessee here at martin they're putting you in the weekly county hall of fame what does that mean to you it means a lot on things you know you can uh i don't care what you say when you get recognition like that it means a lot to you and things and of course i i'm not bragging just stating the fact of course i'm in gibson county and then, of course, UT Martin Hall of Fame, and then the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. And this one means a lot to me, just like those other three. You have touched a lot of lives. I know you're a man of God. How hard is it to be a coach and to be a Christian? Really and truly, when you're coaching, then it's easier to be a Christian because you are challenged in things like that. And you realize that in order to be effective, what you have to do is you have to rely on God a lot of times to give you the strength to do the things you have to do. So when you're coaching, then God is really a welcome presence in whatever you're doing. Thank you so much. I appreciate this time. But more than anything else, I appreciate what you have done for our university, for our community, and for the men and women that you have touched well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today on things, and I appreciate what you all have done here, you know, through the years and things happening with a uh, football program and other programs at the University of Tennessee because you've been a tremendous booster for us through the years. Thank you, sir. That's Coach Bob Carroll, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Gary Caper is in the studio with us today as well. And we've been talking about the latest class of the Weekly County Hall of Fame, which includes... Former coach, University of Tennessee at Martin, Coach Bob Carroll. This is Paul Tinkle, pre-recorded. Thank you, everybody, for listening. You've been listening to 30 Minutes, a community affairs program on Thunderbolt Radio. You can listen to this broadcast and others anytime by visiting thunderboltradio.com and following the Thunderbolt Radio and digital YouTube page. Thanks for listening.